He adds a bit more than when he comes to verse 16. He says this, but having said, I want you to handle God's word accurately, but verse 16, avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. So I would say it this way, in the church, preserve biblical integrity. In the church, with our words, we must preserve biblical integrity. Avoid irreverent babble because it's going to lead people into more and more ungodliness. I mean, the things that are debated about these days in theological circles would make your head spin. The types of debates and arguments you say, it gets off in this path and it gets off in this path. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? What does the Word of God say? Because when the Word of God is not handled in a proper way, it leads us off into paths of ungodliness. In fact, it gets even more severe. In verse 17, he says, And their talk will spread like gangrene. You ever seen gangrene? Perhaps a person's leg has been wounded and an infection sits in. And over a period of time, it turns black and disgusting. And there's no no healing for it. Gangrene is so serious that if you do not amputate the leg above where the infection is, it could kill you. Timothy When you allow this irreverent conversation to go on in your church and never correct it, he says it's like gangrene that spreads like a disease and is going to destroy the life of your church. In fact, he even names an example. He says in verse 17, Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They're upsetting the faith of some. See, all kinds of theological debates were happening in the first century. In the Greek culture, you need to understand something. They had no appreciation for the human body. I mean, they had the Olympic Games and they had their, 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 their uh, competitions, but they felt that basically the body was evil in the Greek culture, in the Roman culture. So they would say that when this life is over and your soul and spirit leave your body, that's a great day. Enough with your body. Thank you. It's just going to be left in the ground. So Christianity comes along, and Jesus Christ has a physical resurrection, and he promises a physical resurrection of our bodies. It it, it blows up the whole notion of what the philosophy of the day was about. So people who were very excited about the resurrection and the fact that we were going to be resurrected, all of a sudden they started saying, well, when Jesus Christ's resurrection happened, all the rest of our resurrection happened too. They say, I'm still here. Look at my body. Did I miss it? Maybe I'm not really a believer. Oh my goodness, what's happening to me? Is something wrong with my faith? Is something wrong with my theology? Is something wrong with my teaching? And it was getting into the church, and and these guys were saying, yep, the resurrection's already over. It's already happened. And it was doing damage to to the nature and the foundation of the church. Look at verse 19. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Two great, great statements. God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. Here's the first. The Lord knows those who are his. Timothy, when you look at the landscape of people and and people in your church, you can't as a human being see their hearts. Some people put on a great face and they look like they're Christians and it sounds like they're followers of Jesus Christ, but honestly, inside their hearts, they they don't belong to Jesus Christ. Other people, you say, I I can't tell what their life is saying, but, but inside, in their heart, they do love the Lord. Timothy, I just want you to know, I want you to be assured of this fact. The Lord knows who are His. Romans 8, chapter 16 says, The Spirit Himself, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are the children of God. There's another reference that says, Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Live what you believe. Let what Jesus Christ has done in your heart and continues to do in your heart, let it change you. Let it transform you. We would say today that if you call yourself a Christian, we would ask this question, is there any evidence to support that assertion? For for years, there's been this example. If you were in a court of law 
and the, the, there was a court case brought against you, and the, the argument was, this person is a Christian. And the prosecuting attorney would try to bring evidence to the fact that you're not, and you would try to explain that you are. The question becomes, is there evidence that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? Jesus once said, by their fruit you shall know them. Timothy, in this church, there's trouble. In the churches in Ephesus, there are arguments, there are babblings over inconsequential things. Timothy, let me tell you, you can't let yourself fall into those traps. You have to steer them. You have to know and understand that the Lord knows who are His. You have to instruct everyone, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Live what you believe. Worthless words versus gracious words. I remember when I was a little boy and I was very passionate about my Christian faith, I would get into these arguments. Arguments about a variety of things and with a variety of different children about things that I was so proud of my faith. and I, I wanted to prove that I was right. But I didn't use gracious words. There are other times when I have learned, fortunately, God's grace, what gracious words are like. It was either my first or second trip to Russia. I don't remember which one it was. But on the flight from Moscow to Amsterdam, I was sitting beside a young lady. And uh, I was tired. I was content to simply read and, and write in my journal and rest. And she seemed to be content to, to write or read whatever she was doing. And after a while, some food was brought to us. We began to eat. So I thought, well, this is a good chance to talk a little bit. So we began to talk. Finally, she, I asked what she did, and she told me what her occupation was. She actually was from Denmark, and she had married a Russian man, and so she actually was on her way home to Denmark for a period of time. I great. And then she said to me, what do you do? Why are you here? And instantly my heart went, oh, no, what do I say? How do you explain that you're going to Russia to teach people how to study the Bible? How do you tell people that I'm a pastor of a church? Because you know that outside of this, the safeness and the security of your little church, people are going to go, you're a pastor? What is a pastor? Why would you teach people? So I was afraid, but I said, you know what? I was teaching a course on the Bible in, in Kursk, Russia. I'm on my way home, and I, I passed her at church, and she said something very interesting to me. She said, you know what? She said, ever since we started talking, there was a piece about you. And it stopped me, and it made me think. I hadn't evangelized her. I hadn't witnessed to her. I hadn't tried anything with her. But somehow in our conversation, she detected in my words, in my gracious words, that there was an inner peace in my soul. And then we began to talk about Christianity. And she wasn't a Christian. She wasn't a follower of Jesus Christ. But she was interested in our conversation. We had a fascinating conversation the rest of the way until our plane landed in Amsterdam. Gracious words. The contrast between worthless words that divide and gracious words that unite or that interest or that intrigue. That no matter where we are or who we're with or what we're doing, that we watch how we use our words. That as followers of Jesus Christ, it shapes who we are. It shapes how we think. It shapes what we say. It shapes what we do. It shapes what we don't. But what we do, we do for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to listen to the words that you say over the next 24 hours with your family, with your wife, with your husband, with the people at your work. What do the words you say say about what you believe? Remember our little phrase, belief drives behavior. What your behavior is like tells you what you really believe. The gracious words of the gospel of Jesus Christ that come out of our mouth should be reflective of a heart that is dedicated to it. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.